this game is bad. I'm not a game reviewer, I'm not even really a YouTuber, but this Vampire the Masquerade fucking chapters has been out for a little while now, and on YouTube at least, there are no reviews. I just wanted to temper people's expectations, because there is a thriving second-hand market for it currently, thankfully for me. Let's, let's talk about it. Okay, okay. Huh. Um, I'm going to be quite scattered. I'm going to be confused. I'm not doing well health-wise. I love Vampire the Masquerade version 5 specifically. It's my in my top three favourite role-playing games of all time. I love the mechanics so much. The hunger system is so thematic and crunchy at the same time. I... When I ran a game of Promethean The Created, I jammed the hunger mechanics into it and I made everyone use Vampire V5 dice because I wanted to spread it about. The Fall of London campaign is genuinely among the best campaign books I've ever played. Possibly the best? I don't know. The best and worst. Uh, I love Vampire the Masquerade. V5. I've played V20, I've played Dark Ages. We did a really cool Dark Ages campaign that one of my friends ran. That was fun. Um, but Vampire, The Masquerade, V20, Dark Ages, and probably other ones as well, they're good role-playing games, but you can really tell they were designed in the 90s. They're cut, there's, there's a lot of stuff in there that doesn't need to be in there. Combat is terror bad. Uh, it's, it's fine. V5 feels like a, an RPG designed for gaming now. And I also love campaign board games. Back at the start of the pandemic, I kind of somehow managed to wind up with a situation where my wife and I went, well, we're stuck inside. Let's play campaign board games. We started off with Clank Legacy. That was really cool. We played Everfields. That was not. But then we, we found some good ones. We um, played Tainted Grail all the way through. This is the expansions. We haven't played the expansions. The core box, the core tainted braille box, I, I have lent out to some of my friends, um, so I don't have it. But yeah, we are possibly the only people in the world to have completed a campaign of tainted grail. We did it by heavily mod modding the game. It's a really great game. I love the story. Both Jen and I love the love story so much. Um, the game itself, we enjoyed for about half of the campaign, and then halfway through, we went, okay. We've played this game now. Let's just play the story. Uh, you can fuck off for a moment. Aeon's End Legacy was a, a gift from a friend. Turned out to be a really expensive gift because it wound up with us buying most of the other Aeon's End boxes. Story-wise, it's a bit thin on, on the ground for game. Super fun. All culminated in ISS Vanguard. ISS Vanguard is staying on my table for the moment. ISS Vanguard for me is the pinnacle of board game campaigns. It has a good story. It has good characters, although the characters are a little bit weaker than Tainted Grail because of reasons. But the story is great. The gameplay is really complex, but it's so focused. In Tainted Grail, everything smudged out all over the place. There were so many bloody components, but... In ISS Vanguard, everything has a very specific point. The dice system is really cool. The exploration system is really cool. It's great. It was a challenge to learn, but it's great. We also played Vampire the Masquerade Heritage. So back at the start of the pandemic, my wife and I had played Clank Legacy. Loved Clank Legacy, played it all the way through. So me being me, I went, great, we're doing this now. I backed a load of games on Kickstarter. And I was overjoyed when a Kickstarter campaign for Vampire the Masquerade chapters launched. Cut to 2023. I have completed Tainted Grail, ISS Vanguard, uh, a bunch of Aeon's End Legacy and campaign games around that. Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion, Vampire the Masquerade Heritage, probably some others as well, right? And then vampire chapters show up. And I know that this game is going to struggle. 
because the history of Vampire the Masquerade chapters, which we might just call chapters, is a history of a campaign being not brilliantly managed. I think that's fair to say. Flyos who make it, they seem like passionate people, but they, the game was delayed so much and spiralled so out of control. I don't think it's particularly controversial to say that they're not great at at least running projects, right? The delays, Jesus Christ, the delays. Okay. But you don't necessarily need to be great at running projects to create great art, right? Hey, buddy. I'm getting distracted. The, the, there are two reasons why Vampire of Masquerade Chapters... There are three reasons why Vampire of Masquerade Chapters is bad. The most important one is the story. The story comes in these little chapter books. And we can talk about the design decision to break the story up into little books. It's got upsides and downsides. It made my decision to take what the components we needed to the place my group and I were going to play. It made that easier. I could I could take this book, which was chapter number two, and some others, and not the entire 60 fucking booklets or whatever. That's cool. Okay. So I want to talk about this. This is chapter number two. Fucking spoilers for chapter number two. It doesn't matter. Trust me. So the writing in this game is edgelordy and amateurish. Vampire V5 has a bit of a problem with being edgelordy anyway. Vampire the Masquerade has a bit of a problem with being edgelordy and sort of generic. It's the world of darkness, you know, everything's run down and bad and everyone's poor except for rich people who are just living in their own, like, hyper-capitalist nightmare. And yes, cool, but the way you write that has to be a little bit careful because otherwise it comes across as 90s, which is appropriate, and kind of teenage. Vampire V5 famously got itself in a bit of trouble for falling into this problem. In one case, by linking real-world atrocities to fucking vampires, which was not a great look, but the other comes from the Bruja clan page, which says... Uh, whoever Bruja, common perceptions place punks, gang members, maladjusted immigrants rejected by a society that should protect them, and placard-carrying and Molotov-wielding rioters among the Bruja, etc, etc. Their desire for rebellion reaches as deep as the fraudster ripping off his own company, the lawyer representing the poor pro bono, the neo-Nazi claiming to be alt-right, and the basement-dwelling dr- downloading thousands of movies illegally for re- redistribution on streaming sites. The neo-Nazi claiming to be alt-right. Alt-right, the alt-right are neo-Nazis. That's their thing. It's just such a bizarre thing to say. You can't know anything about the alt-right without knowing that they are, you know, extremely hard-right, and whilst not all extreme-right individuals are fascist, it's very likely that the further right you go, the more you kind of inevitably drift into fascism. The Venn diagram, which includes the neo-Nazis and the alt-right, has a lot of overlapping material. And so claiming that a neo-Nazi is rebelling by claiming to be alt-right in the same way a rich lawyer is rebelling by doing pro bono work, that's kind of a spicy take. He speaks in chapter four of chapters. I won't spoil the content of four because you might be actually wanting to play this thing for some goddamn reason. Uh, but, like, the description of the apartment building that this chapter takes place in. You advance into the living room. There's a bunch of trash on the floor. Rotting leftover food, discarded boxes, and a host of other things, including flies fluttering around the whole thing. You make a check. Oh, yeah, we go to the investigation section. Let's talk about a positive thing. These books come in different sections. There are events. You start each chapter by reading event one, and it gives you some context. And you often, like, then look to a battle map, like this. And the battle map will have tokens on it. They will have investigation tokens, they will have NPCs, and you can go, I'm going to go to that investigation token and poke at that. And the investigation token will go, great, look up a thing, a, a, a chapter in this book. This is cool. That's a very cool idea. It's 
like a very gamey choose your own adventure book uh but with an actual game behind it rather than do you want to go down the left corridor or the right corridor with all the blood smeared on the walls i went down the right corridor oh no you got smudged by a trap i think this is the reason people would like this game there are tw- no there are a bunch of prologues that you play single player prologues and the investigation prologue which you play as a malkavian is genuinely really good and is like the best thing that i encountered with this game upon further inspection you discover a couple of discarded blunts porn magazines and a bunch of other things you'd rather not think about who even buys porn mags these days pointing out your bad writing is not a good substitute for going back and changing your bad writing. You're about to give up when a roach catches your attention. It's crawling on top of a piece of clothing. You casually slap it out of the way and pull out a piece of clothing, causing more trash to fall over. Underneath this extra pile of junk, you find a couple of straws. When you bring them closer to your eyes, <laughs> you note residues of a thin white powder. Looks like the ghoul was doing drugs. You lean over and pick up the piece of clothing from earlier. It's a glove. You find the second one. It's been thrown away, not too far. The thick material they're made of seems to indicate they are working gloves. Not too far from the second glove you find, you also spot a breathing mask. The ghoul was definitely making ammunition here. You decide to keep investigating the apartment. Okay, so uh, those of you who know anything about writing generally or fiction will have spotted a few problems in there. The first is the edge lordiness I talked about. Like it's, it's just ah, uh, you discover a couple of discarded blunts, porn magazines, and a bunch of other things you'd rather not think about. What if the vampires are Nosferatu? They probably wouldn't care about what's in the fucking rubbish. This is after having gone up through a dilapidated apartment building where all the TVs are on really loud and all the neighbours are yelling at each other. You may not care about the edge lordiness, but this is kind of a problem in that. I generally don't play Vampire the Masquerade so I can like really steep myself in urban squalor because I live in urban squalor. <laughs> I live in one of the most deprived areas of London. Don't let the wall behind me fool you. And maybe you really like the urban squalor aspect of Vampire the Masquerade. That's cool. But an issue they had with making this game is role-playing games specifically attract people for a bunch of different reasons. This is why it was so remarkable that the recent Dungeons & Dragons film was so good. It's because people play D&D for all sorts of reasons. You have the weirdos who just play combat and just want to get extra loot. And you have people who want to play a story, and you have people who don't care about combat. Why would you play D&D if you don't care about combat? Because you don't know about better RPGs. Yes, thanks, Mike. So when you play Vampire the Masquerade, you can be playing it for a whole bunch of reasons. And this game is locking you into one of them by going, yes, this is the focus. We're doing urban squalor. We're doing this like really specific interpretation of the world of darkness. Mm. The first uh, Vampire Masquerade thing I played was Bloodlines back in 2004 because I'm a normie. Uh, and I love that. And that also did urban squalor. But I think there's a difference between encountering urban squalor as part of a video game where it doesn't necessarily go remarked upon. There was a lot of urban squalor, lots of like rubbish lying over the floor. You'd go in dingy apartments. Your first Santa Monica apartment, dingy as fuck, right? But you wake up in the dingy apartment and you're sort of wandering around and you encounter how fucked up it is and how dingy and squalid it is. But you don't have purple prose descriptions of how fucked up the apartment building is and then just spend a lot of paragraphs reinforcing that same thing. The second problem is the flow of information. When you write a description, you are supposed to make it so that information flows naturally. So in this section, underneath the extra pile of junk, you're about to give up when, you, when a roach catches your attention. It's crawling on top of a piece of clothing. You casually slap it out of the way and pull out a piece of clothing, causing more trash to fall over. Now that casually slap it away is a problem because in this you can play as Malkavian, Nosferatu, Tremere, Venturi, Toreador, all those. Now the thing about the Toreador, which is kind of neat, is in this chapter Toreadors are at minus one to all their dice checks because it's so squalid, right? But 
if you're playing a Toreador and you read that, you casually slap it aside, you're a Toreador, no, you don't. One of the problems with the writing is it is telling you how you do things and it is telling you how you feel about things. And because of the vast variety of clans in Vampire the Masquerade, all of them are going to react quite differently to the same situation. So rather than saying there's a roach on top of the clothing and like saying to the player, how would your character react to this? And like going, hey, engage with this story. Tell us, tell the group tell the story how your character is feeling in this moment. It doesn't do that. And yeah, sure, it wouldn't have an impact on the gameplay, but it's less dissonant than having a Torridor just casually brush aside a cockroach. Same with a Ventru. Would a Ventru just go, oh yes, <laughs> cockroaches, I deal with these all the time. There's a lot of this telling your characters how you feel and how you are doing stuff. It's crawling on top of a piece of clothing. You casually slap it out of the way and pull out a piece of clothing, calling more trash to fall over. A couple of sentences later, you lean over and pick up the piece of clothing from earlier. It's a glove. You find the second one. It's been thrown away not too far. The thick material they're made of seems to indicate they're, they are working gloves. Okay. So you brush a ro roach off a piece of clothing and you pull out the piece of clothing. So you have the piece of clothing in your hand. When you have it in your hand, you will realize it as a glove. When you smash the roach off it, you'll realize it's a glove, right? If you were there in the moment, you wouldn't go, I'm shwishing a roach off a piece of clothing. You'd go, oh, I'm shwishing the roach off this glove. You wouldn't necessarily like think those specific words, but your brain and your eyes would have gone glove, right? And the reason in books that they don't necessarily name everything is because not everything matters. So you would possibly say, I brush a roach off a piece of clothing if the piece of clothing doesn't matter. If it, because if you say, I brush a roach off a glove, you are telling the audience that the fact that it is a glove is important in some way and they should possibly be paying attention to the fact that it's a glove, right? And if it's not important that it's a glove, if you're just doing this for edgelord purposes, then calling it a piece of clothing makes a lot of sense because it's just a piece of clothing, it doesn't matter, it's just there for ambiance, right? But the problem is, we then find out, a couple of sentences later, that it is a glove. So why didn't they say, rather than it's crawling on top of a piece of clothing, why not it's crawling on top of a glove? Because then the flow would be, it's crawling on top of a glove. You slap it out of the way and pull out the glove, calling more trash, causing more trash to fall over. You then lean over and pick up the glove from earlier. You find the second one. It's been thrown away not too far. The thick material they're made from seems to be, seems to indicate that they're working gloves. Okay, cool. There are a lot of words there that don't need to be there. So let's do another edit. You're about to give up when a roach catches your attention. It's crawling on top of a thick workman's glove. It's, it's crawling on top of a thick work glove. There must be a better way. Canvas, w whatever those work gloves are made from, that's what you'd say. Let's say it's splibbity, okay? <sighs> You're about to give up when a roach catches your attention. It's crawling on top of a thick splibbity glove. You casually slap it away and pull out the splibbity glove, calling, causing more trash to fall over. You lean over and pick up the splibbity glove from earlier. You find the second one, thrown away not too far. Not far from the second glove, you also spot a breathing mask. That is less than half of the number of words used. Technically, the number of words doesn't massively matter. Uh, if those words are all good and serving a purpose. This is a book I wrote six years ago. Mate, God, more than that now. I self-published it before I really knew what I was doing, hence why the cover's not great. It's too big and it's about 20,000 words longer than it needs to be. I spotted the door set into the right hand wall. It was about halfway along its length. I slowed as I approached, regaining control of my breathing. I was free of Alison's company and about to see the one person who could answer any and all of my questions. I raised my hand, I knocked on the door, the door swung open, I gasped. You see how cutting that six-ish line paragraph down to about two would have been just better because all she does is approach a door, knock on a door. It doesn't need to be six lines. You're wasting the reader's time.
in, in literary fiction, you can spend six lines uh, having someone approach a door and knock on a door. But so much of the stuff I was saying in that paragraph was just irrelevant. The door being halfway along the length of the wall. Why is that there? Like, it's not relevant. It doesn't come back. It doesn't mean anything. It's not some great piece of prose which tells us anything about the place that Susan, the protagonist, is in. It's just there because I had a picture in my head and I wanted to communicate that to a reader. It's bad writing. And upon further inspection, you discover a couple of discarded blunts, porn magazines, and a bunch of other things you'd rather not think about. Who even buys porn mags these days? It's just reinforcing stuff the players already know. There's a moment in the same chapter where these two show up because the apartment's been, the, the apartment you're investigating has been broken into. So they show up and go, hi, your apartment's been broken into. The chapter has just set up this, this apartment building full of urban squalor where everyone's watching their TVs too loud and the entire place is covered in rubbish and everything's broken and nothing works. They are presenting the sort of apartment building <laughs> that I've lived in. Uh, they're presenting this sort of apartment building where no one cares about anything else because if if you like get involved in your neighbor's business, like you put yourself at risk of violence, basically. And so these two people showing up to go, hey, your apartment's been broken into. Are you okay? Wait, who are you guys? It breaks the rules of the world that they have set up. I didn't want to spend as much time as I did talking about that one. I wanted to talk about the ghoul and the flour mill. So you're looking for a ghoul in this chapter, and in the one we were just talking about, you go to his apartment. When you find this ghoul, you're interrogating him. And I'm not going to read the chapter because I've already done a bunch of reading for this, and this is going long, so let's not. Oh my god, there's, 40, there's 44 pieces of dialogue in this one chapter, and that can sound good. With there being so many pieces of dialogue, you're making choices. You can wind up with item cards, which you then can use later. Like in the first chapter we came across, we found a set of keys, which could have helped in some way, although we never quite actually worked out how. And you might get extra XP for doing some of this stuff. Okay, so this is the end of chapter two. The, old, the cold, breezy air blows through the open window. They've reminded us of this open window about four times by this one. Everything is dead quiet and the atmosphere is tense. Something's wrong with Etienne St. Denis. Etienne? Etienne? You call out. Your eyes dart towards the exit. You assume he's going to try bypassing you any second now. His blank expression concerns you, however. He looks pale and ghastly. It's like you're barely even there. He takes a couple of steps backwards and towards the window. I have said too much. He's French-Canadian. I don't know if that's what they sound like. Before you can react, Sabat Ghoul lets himself fall into the void. As soon as the shock's worn off, you dash towards him, but it's too late. You look through the window, your eyes glance furtively around until they finally rest on an increasingly glowing red spot on the ground. It's Etienne's body in what's obvi an obviously unnatural position. A pool of blood is forming under him, staining the asphalt ground. You hear the two workers outside scream and see them run towards what was once Etienne St. Denis. By the time the police and ambulance arrive, you're already long gone. I've already done um, some looking at the writing in the previous chapter, so I'm not going to go into that one because there's too much wrong on that one page for me to want to actually get into it. I want to be clear. If you heard me describe, if you heard me reading from those chapters and go, I don't really see what the problem is, that sounds fine to me. That's genuinely good. Like, those chapters are the primary reason why I can't play this game. Because everything else, like, I'm gonna get into the gameplay now and also the production of it. If the gameplay, if you don't like the gameplay, just use this. This is better. That's the really good thing about it being Vampire the Masquerade, V5 specifically, is because you can just use the V5 book there was one reason why you might not want to use the V5 book. The character sheets in this are streamlined. There are attributes and there are skills. In the 
main game, there are nine attributes, and this there are three. Rather than rolling dice, you in the in the RPG, you pick the number of dice as per dots you have in your attributes, and the number of dice dice as you have per dots in the relevant skill. In this, skills are automatic successes, so you only roll the number of dice as per your attribute, which are skill, no, which are physical, social, and mental, right? It's much more streamlined, but it's also much more streamlined in a way which I didn't think particularly needs streamlining. Picking those number of, so picking two dots for strength and three dots for weapons, for example, that, and then rolling five dice, that doesn't slow the game down much. It's just, all, I, I appreciate this approach to streamlining, but I don't think that particularly needed streamlining. However, the combat system in this definitely did. There is a very complex combat system in this, and I don't think it's very good, especially as this come, came out after Gloomhaven and Tainted Grail, two games that had genuinely the best combat systems that I have ever encountered in a board game ever even leaving aside war games like Warhammer and other war games, presumably, <laughs> that aren't made by Games Workshop. I don't know, I'm English. We get those things at birth. So they kept the combat as really complex. There is a stealth system, which is interesting in that every NPC has a stealth rating and they have cones of vision. And the further away you are, the easier a stealth check is. And if you approach from the side or behind, a stealth check is easier. And that's cool. But the thing is, because it's combined with a battle map, so when we were approaching that ghoul, the building the ghoul was in, there were two workers in the doorway. And the thing about that is because the workers are in very specific places and because you need to get to a very specific place behind those workers, and because there is a crunchy stealth system, it's very rigid in a way the RPG wouldn't be. If you have that situation in Fall of London, it would say there are two workers near the entrance to the building. And then the GM can decide what that means. And if the players go, okay, I want to slip past them, then the GM will go, okay, it's a difficult stealth check. You're going to need four successes, right? And the players get two successes. Oh, no, they were too close to the building. Or they get 12 successes and, I, oh, yeah, you're able to slip through the shadows, right? Because it's all in the people's heads, the players and the GMs, the world is malleable. The GM could finesse it, depending on what sort of game they and the players enjoy playing. If it was a dickhead GM who really liked making things difficult for players and the players were into that because they're subs, then they could make it like really, really difficult stuff. But if they were just playing for the story, then then like there will be two workers wandering the lot, but they wouldn't necessarily be in the doorway the whole time. So rather than have a sneak past these dudes, which you could have done, it would have been very difficult, but you could have done. There were like four investigation tokens about the map. And then at the start of the chapter, they go, there's a car over here, there's a night watchman over here, there's something or other over there. And the first thing I did was go up to the car and the book was like, great. There's a car. You could set off a car alarm if you wanted to draw over for workmen. So I was like, okay, I was a technical person, so I set the car alarm off, drew the workers away. On the battle map, we moved the workers over to the car. We moved all the players. It didn't ask us if we wanted to move the players. We moved the players. We walked in. We were on that battle map for two actions. <laughs> Me? No, three. I moved over to the car. I set the car alarm off. We walked through the door. Very simple. Then in the warehouse, there were four investigation tokens. We were looking for this ghoul. And so there are these tokens on the map and you don't know what the tokens are, they're just tokens. So you go up to a token, you find a bit in the chapter and the chapter tells you what the token is. Your character is right next to the token. You, your character can see what the token is, but one of the tokens turned out to be a person. So we just walked up to a person when we were trying to stealth through this warehouse and just started talking to them. We could have seen the person. When we looked into the room, we were like, there's a person in there. Let's not go in there. It also has the problem that in the in the game, we had my, my Tremere character, who was quite an investigating, magic -y person. And we had a Venturi, who was a very social build, not a good investigator. And we some, because you can't, you don't know what the tokens are before you interact with them, we wound up in a situation where the Venturi in, approached investigation token X, and it turned out to be an investigation check. And... 
they failed the investigation because they didn't have an investigation skill. And my Tremere approached investigation token Y, and it turned out to be a person, and my Tremere failed the social check because she didn't have any social skills. To summarise, the combat is fiddly, it's not terrible. What is extremely fiddly is you have all these combat cards. These are all the NPC cards, right? And there are so many of them finding out, and they all have stats on them, like they have the cat, whether this is a, uh, what sort of person this is, whether this is an aggressive character or they're neutral, what their vision range is for the stealth, and you've got their initiative, their attack, resistance, special attack. So that's all like, yeah, that's cool. But there are so many of them. Finding the right one is a faff. Distracted guard, overworked guard, older guard, gang member, second shambling grizzling dead, third, fourth, first, hulking rising dead, first, second, third, fourth, first crowd, second crowd, third crowd, second security guard, third security guard. Why do you not have security guard? Because they all have to have individual health tracks. Okay, but that has wound up us up with this many cards that you have to flick through and find individual ones per chapter, and the chapters aren't that long. You wound up with this many cards because they all have, have to have individual health tracks. Why not track the health individually using the same card? The first construction worker and the second construction worker aren't going to have fundamentally different stats. This is to be compared to ISS Vanguard, a game that takes place across an entire galaxy and it has this many NPC cards. A quarter of the number that Vampire Chapters has, maybe less, and the game plays a lot better. As I have ISS Vanguard open, I should show you this. This tells you how to put the box away. It's lovely. It's so nice. Vampire Chapters doesn't have anything like that. They had to put a video on YouTube telling you how to actually arrange the components in the box. And that sort of thing doesn't necessarily matter. But what it is, is really demonstrating that Chapters was designed before a lot of the modernization of campaign games. Campaign board games are still relatively new. There's a lot of innovation happening all the time. And that's a broad statement, it's a bold statement. It's one I can back up thanks to which uh, the old world. This game arrived for me a couple of days ago. It has a bunch of minis. Big whoop, lots of games have minis. Each mini has a little number on the bottom. This is number 17. To put it away, you don't have to find the slot in the tray for it. You just find number 17, bang, put it in the slot. I've never come across a game where they just have something simple like putting the mini number on the bottom and then putting that same number on the slot. Whereas with Vampire the Masquerade Chapters, it has so many components, it has so many uh, cards and tokens, and it's and the, the box just has a bunch of slots, and it's really not clear where everything should go. Old World has this. This is how you put it away. And so Vampire Chapters doesn't have any quality of life features like that, that games that came out around the same time or significantly before, in the case of ISS Vanguard, it didn't have those quality of life features. And ISS Vanguard was published after a really long process of growth for Awaken Realms. Awaken Realms released Everfield and Tainted Whale, not in that order. Um, both of which were games which had significant Kickstarter bloat. They had real problems as games. I love them, but they're great. I have this in my hand. This is all the story for ISS Vanguard. It's the logbook. This is the usual solution, rather than having all these little chapter books. I prefer this because you have one thing, you take it with you everywhere. It's not really that big. The thing I really prefer, though, is having an app with all the stuff on it and you, you goes, hey, you're in a corridor. Do you want to go left or you right? You click left. It then goes, great, you went left. You're going this way. And it's cool that this is set up like a choose your own adventure, but so is this in its own way. It's just, it's less influence. It's less obviously aping choose your own adventure games and it's more modern. 
And we could say, yeah, you can't expect every company to put out an app because apps are expensive. Awaken Realms make a load of money from their Kickstarters. So did this. But this started designing before a bunch of other games came out that have since made a load of innovations. And it's possibly unfair of me to complain about this not being as innovative as other games or having all the quality of life features that I have come to expect from other games that, came, that were designed after this, having them. And I think that's a reasonable point. It's, it doesn't affect my experience of the game. It makes this still feel old, even though it was only designed a few years ago. What's less excusable is this is the rule book. It doesn't have a fucking index. It has a glossary. It tells you this is what a neonate is, a young kindred recently embraced, but more than a fledgling. Okay, cool. It doesn't have a rules index though. So when one of my when our venture character um, unlocked a discipline that like lets them stop fleeing NPCs, we're like, okay, great. What is a fleeing NPC? And because this doesn't have a rules index, we couldn't just look up the word flee. We had to scour the fucking rule book to go, okay, fleeing, 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 fleeing. Okay, it's there. None of these are necessarily killer problems. If they don't sound like they would bother you, cool. Get it. Maybe. But for me, the writing being painful and the gameplay being finickety and not actually that great and the actual quality of the product being janky and antiquated and just, just kind of out of date despite being really quite modern in the, in the scheme of things killed my enjoyment of it. Now, I write books. I have written books and I have explained that uh, some of my books, the, my older material, have similar writing problems to the writing in this game. My writing is a lot better now, I should say. But the, the reason I brought this up is I am more keenly aware of bad writing than most people would be because I have had to really learn to spot it in my own work, right? So when we were, my friends and I were playing this school at the flower mill and the apartment chapter, my friends were finding the bad writing funny. So if you're, if you're like having, if you're happy to have a laugh with your friends at like the cheesy writing and then constantly repeating just one more thing, we need to get just one more thing out of him, one more thing, you could just ask him all the things. You're vampires, he's a ghoul, there's no, there's no one else about. Like you could just do whatever, it's fine. If it was an RPG, your characters could approach that situation in a way which felt much more natural. If that doesn't sound like it will bother you, absolutely fine. Like, that's legit. It bothered me quite so much because I, of my own, like, writing journey. <sighs> Whatever. But genuinely, if you wanted to play an RPG in the box, I think you would be better off running this. The only advantage that Chapters has over Fall of London is there's no need for a GM in chapters. And that takes the burden off someone being the GM. And that's fair. Not everyone wants to be the GM. Being a GM is a lot of work. Legit. That's cool. But the thing is, that all, taking away the GM also takes away any ability the game has to react to you outside of its paradigm. And its paradigm is all... You ask this one specific question, you might get a reward for doing that question. Like, if you talk to a park keeper, you might unlock a set of keys. If you persuade from your undercover cops or whatever, you might get into the park keeper's shed. That's cool. And, like, that is how the game reacts to you. But it also cannot react to you in terms of character. We talked about the Tremere or Venture casually brushing a roach aside off of a work glove. And the problem is... Vampire the Masquerade is a game about characters. It's not a game necessarily about going up and like fulfilling a choose your own adventure game where you talk to the park keeper and tell him you're an undercover cop and so you get the key so you can get into the shed so you don't have to break a window. It's a game about being vampires in this dark world, right? And so essentially the game abandons character because it can't react to character. 
because that's not the sort of game it is. So it has to instead focus the player agency, the choices you make, on the specific things you're doing in the game, which won't really match up particularly well with any one character because it has to be able to... The choices have to be conceivably done by a Malkavian, a Ventru, a Tremere, a Nosferatu, a Toreador, and then also the Ministry and uh, the other ones, La Sombra, because there are also expansion characters. And these are all very different sorts of people. And ISS Vanguard got around the, that idea because ISS Vanguard also has loads and loads and loads of different characters. It has, oh God, maybe a hundred characters that you can play as. But they get around it by going, these are all members of a space exploration team. And so they are all, they are all relatively professional, but because the mission was created in a hurry, they also are kind of jokey and a bit, ugh, this is a bit weird. So the, char- the characters you play as are kind of generic. Um, in terms of the game, and it's all about the story and the NPCs. You're not playing this to express an individual persona, whereas in this, you are playing one character the entire time. In ISS Vanguard, you'll play many different characters throughout the game. In this, you're playing one. They have a very specific personality, which they establish through prologues. That's the point of the game. You're playing a specific personality, but the specific personality doesn't interact with the story because if you're playing this Toreador, if you're playing it with just a Toreador and a, tri- and a Ventru, you will brush that roach aside as casually as if you were playing a Nosferatu and a Bruja. And so what, what the fuck is the point in making a game where you can play as all these different characters if you're not going to have those characters present differently? Why wouldn't they just you can play as Bruja, let's say Tremere, Gangrel, uh, Nosferatu, the characters who would not necessarily balk at brushing a roach casually aside off a work glove, right? But they didn't want to do that because everyone wants to be able to play their own sort of vampire. It's just a confused game. It's fiddly. It's got design decisions which are not modern. The story, in my opinion, is bad. It might improve. My group and I played the prologues. We played the first few chapters. We, uh, the chapter, the Ghoul in the Apartment, I think was chapter five. There are many chapters. There are 41 and some side quests. So in terms of the actual story content, I have seen a sliver of it, a tiny amount. I have absolutely no faith that it would get better. In my opinion... I can't recommend this when there are games which are so much better. If you want a game that tells a grand story that reacts to your choices and that is genuinely a really tight board game, it's a really engaging board game that really feels like everything is there for a purpose and everything is there to facilitate you engaging with this world, ISS Vanguard. If you want a dark fantasy world where your character is engaging with this sort of grim, hopeless place, which has a focus on character, Tainted Grail. But be aware that you will have to mod the shit out of that game because it's it's very grindy. If you are thinking of buying Vampire the Masquerade chapters, I would urge you to wait and see what the other opinions are because there's a lot of excitement for this game people have been waiting for a long 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 time but believe me when i say there are better games out there